Listen, this is Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback. Don't touch that dial. Hi, everybody. This is Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback, with one of our all-time favorite guests, Lacey Hunt. So, Lacey, you are uh, 82 years young, right? <laughs> well, not quite. I'm 81 and a half. 81. Oh, no, somebody said you're 80. Oh, like you don't look out. Me, you don't God. look a day over 69. So, uh, but um, I, I'm. I don't know if you realize this, but you're a bit of an internet celebrity. <laughs> I bring this up more since you've come on because whenever we do a YouTube with you, it's one of our most watched YouTubes. And even though I'm not really in the new, you know, we're we we have a budding YouTube channel, but really I'm known as a radio host on 710 WOR, one of the biggest radio stations in the country. And it's funny, you you seem to be very popular among people in their 30s, 40s, in a younger demographic. And I remember we would do whole rooms on the app called Clubhouse devoted to people listening to your tapes. And I think you were surprised when you found that out. I am very surprised. I'm, I remain astonished. And you that, have. Uh, the younger crowd knows me because this is a, uh, in January, I'll start my 55th year of my career. <laughs> so, yeah, you so, seem uh, to have become a bit of a cult celebrity in, of all things, the Bitcoin world. Mm-hmm. So Bitcoiners tend to love you as well. So like, there will be Bitcoin meetup groups on monetary policy featuring Lacey Hunt and <laughs> Bitcoin. It's a, it's an interesting p- And I've pairing. never made a statement on Bitcoin, and I don't consider myself very knowledgeable on the field. Yeah, I don't think it. I think it's <laughs> the things that you say resonate with a crowd that is looking for something more in terms of monetary policy, fiscal policy. They sort of want to... They want to go to the old paths, the more conservative fiscal restraint, things like that. So um, everyone wants to know uh, your economic outlook. So take us on a tour of each sector of the economy and your outlook for 2024. Okay, let's hit the big sectors. Uh, First of all, um, the global economy is very sick. Uh, the key measure that I use is the volume of international trade. Um, it's down almost 5% in the last 12 months. Uh, typically, the United States and everybody else is in a recession uh, when global trade is down this much. Uh, it's an indication that the economic problems in the United States are just part and parcel of a, of a broader picture. Uh, the most critical sector. Uh, is is the is our consumer um, uh, large components of the service sector are pretty stable they don't fluctuate very much but I, I think that uh, we're going to see um, significant weakness in the big ticket consumer uh, items uh, in in 2024 we saw a little bit of that uh, as the year progressed and I think it'll be considerably plainer uh, the, the problem here is that financially, uh, the majority of our people are very pressed financial conditions. Uh, a survey uh, recently from the prestigious University of Michigan found that almost two thirds of our households are not not going to make the next paycheck uh, at the end of the month, or they don't know whether they will make the paycheck at the end of the month. Um, construction, uh, there will be some mixed trends. Um, I think the uh, single family market will recover as the mortgage rates come down. There's been a little bit of that going on already. However, uh, multifamily construction, I, I think, is going to have a considerable weakness in, in 2024. Um, there, there's been over significant overbuilding of apartments. Rents are coming down. Uh, another disturbing design here is that uh, the delinquency rates in the multifamily area are going up. Another another issue is that uh, there were a lot of properties uh, that were uh, financed 
uh, at the low of the interest rate cycle in 2020 and 2021, at a time when credit uh, standards of the of the, the multifamily builders was a lot higher. Uh, those loans are rolling over now. Uh, the credit quality of the of the people that borrowed funds in 2020 and 2021 has weakened a lot. So they, they're going to have to pay a higher spread against the prime rates. And uh, I think foreclosures have already started happening in the multifamily sector and more of that's to come. In, in commercial uh, real estate. Well, let's I stop. Um, I just want to follow up on the multifamily issue. Where, where, which regions particular? Because in New Jersey, where I live, it doesn't seem like there's any building. It seems like there's a dearth of housing. Now, maybe our particular spot, a lot of Brooklyn and New York City kind of is still bleeding down due to COVID. Uh, they, they don't want to be stuck in a city. So they've kind of migrated to the suburbs. Um, so I'm just focusing on the region where I live, where it seems like there still is a housing shortage. Is it is my thing just is our region kind of an anomaly and I don't look at regional figures. Uh, figures I concentrate on the national. What what is uh, what do you get like the Fred the twenty uh, what is it the the Fred uh, twenty city index? I look at I, I, well in terms of I'm, I'm, I I want to distinguish. I, in the, the single family market will recover. I, I the, the, my problem is not the single family. Okay, it's multifamily it's, because they use the cheap multi-family money. Multifamily sector is is the one where I see the difficulty. I agree with that 100%. And yeah. I think that the rents are coming down um, uh, from the from the big firms that survey this. Uh, I think one of the series that that I've seen which has been pretty reliable shows that rents are now down in the 3 to 4% range from a year ago. And uh, that's where the delinquencies are. We have we have we've overbuilt the uh, one of the one of the areas that probably received more of the excess liquidity in 2020 and 2021 was the multifamily sector. And that's the one that's the most vulnerable. Yeah, definitely. I remember in 2020, people would say, oh, you know, you want to get rich quick, uh, become a multifamily landlord and use the cheap money to buy, you know, $10 million buildings. Then the rents will pay your note, all this other stuff. People were on all over social media talking about multifamily. And now it's kind of a scam, not a scam, but so where do you get your data? So if I want to look or show our, our viewers, where are you seeing this negative news in multifamily, just so I could reference it? Well, I think probably the, the Redfin survey on rents is the best place to go. Redfin? But, yeah, Redfin. They're a big okay. uh, real, realty firm that collect information. And, and the weakness in rents. Also, um, if, you, if you look at, if you, if you Google foreclosures of multifamily, apartments that have been taking place uh some of those articles have fairly um good descriptions of the problem the general overcapacity, the fact that a lot of projects were financed at very very low rates they had two or three year financing on on really a long-term investment so those those loans have to now be refinanced um the cap rates were were very low then which means you could you could borrow a substantial amount of what you had invested in the project. Now the cap rates are considerably higher, um, and so you cannot borrow as much against the property. A lot of people went in with very thin equity, and um, because it was considered such a sure thing, just as you said, and uh, I think there's going to be uh, quite a fallout in that sector as we go through the year. Definitely. So just Google uh, multifamily foreclosures and I should see some stuff. I, I saw the red hey, data. Yeah, there, there have been several projects that have gone on and there'll um, be more. But who do you trust? Like when you look at data, generally Redfin? And- well, you can also you can also look at the housing uh, figures and go to uh, look at the multifamily versus the single family and look at the amount of the single, the multifamily construction that took place over the last three years been extremely high and it was really outside what the demographics require and and that's a, a, a key fundamental element 
in, in my forecast for that sector. So uh, let's go to commercial real estate. I'm kind of worried about the same estate, thing in multifamily for estate, commercial. Uh, I look at the the Moody's office vacancy rate, um, which is the uh, which is the lowest now since the 1990s. There's very very substantial oversupply of office space, and um, I think that uh, that sector will be weak not only in 2024 but for several years. We're going to have a long term workout situation here. In the office sector, what 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 do you think will precipitate its uh, increase again? I mean, COVID, obviously, twenty twenty low rates, people buying commercial buildings in twenty twenty before the sort of COVID meltdown. That makes sense. Almost the same theory behind the multifamily boom and then bust. Uh, people aren't returning to work. I'm seeing places like uh, Regis and IWG. Uh, they're they're even retooling work spaces so people, for three hundred dollars, they get a room, or for twelve hundred dollars, they get an office. So they're kind of changing the way people go to work now. Is it just people aren't renting five thousand square feet buildings anymore? Well, I'll also keep in mind that. Um, if you if you look outside of your high multiplier sector, which would be um, which would be the uh, big ticket items, both the business and the consumer sector, international trade and the like, um, in the last um, in the last three months, uh, we've we've had only a hundred an average of a hundred thousand gain in employment a month. Um, and those are all in very staid, uh, low multiplier sectors. And so there's, there's just not the demand uh, for office space at the present time. And I think we're going to con- continue to see um, further weakness in the labor markets. And so the oversupply that we see today is not ultimately going to, it's, it's, it's lower now than it will, it, it will go lower as the year progresses as the labor markets continue to weaken. <laughs> what about um, any, anything else on the commercial real estate front? That's, that's not all. It, uh, it's bleak. Uh, huh? another, another, well, another problem in the commercial sector, you have the same problem you do uh, in the multifamily construction. Uh, there was a lot of interim financing that was arranged at very, very low rates, uh, which allowed the, um, construction to go forward at a very substantial pace. Uh, and, and now that short-term financing is no longer available. And also the credit quality of the borrowers has deteriorated. Hmm. So the likelihood of, um, of a, a replication of that um, is, not, is not in the cards, and we're going to have to work off those excess supplies that were created. So, okay, we, we talked about commercial. We've talked about multifamily. I guess uh, big ticket items, cars, things of that nature. Y- you you reference big ticket items are down. What what big big ticket items particularly? I, I think we'll see it. I think we're, we're we're starting to see weakness across the board. For example, um, uh, if you if you look at the vehicle sales um, in the in the fourth quarter of this year, uh, there there was a decline from the second to the third, and then another decline from third to the fourth and and the level 15 and three quarter million annual rate which is what it was in the fourth quarter um is 13 or 14 percent below uh the the peaks that were reached over the last five years uh, the sector is not really that strong um uh, another problem too uh, is that um over the last uh, 13 quarters in other words the uh, expansion that occurred uh, after the COVID recession ended, the real average hourly earnings of our full-time hourly and salaried people, which is about 120 million people, uh, has declined at a 2.5% annual rate. Um, and uh, over that same time period, uh, your, your new car prices uh, have risen in the 12 to 14% range. Cox Automotive 
recently did a a, a, a survey uh, of the buying power, and they found that new car prices were too high for about 61% of our households. And that, that's one of the problems with inflation. When you have an inflationary surge, such as we did in 2020 and 2021 and into the first half of 2022, um, it elevates the big ticket items. But inflation robs everyone, but it robs the moderate and modest households the most. And they lag behind, as they always do. Uh, and so um, the car prices became very elevated. Real income has fallen. Uh, and, and so now you have a disconnect with buying power from a huge swath of the American economy and the car levels. The inflation rate is coming down, but we're still stuck with very, very high car prices. Same problem exists in housing. And that, that's one of the reasons why it takes a long time uh, to unwind all of the all of the effects of of a uh, inflationary episode because you 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 get elevation and real wages deteriorate and therefore you um, disenfranchise buyers in, in in cars and housing and a whole host of other things when you have an inflationary episode it takes time to unwind that josh yeah it's anecdotal but i kind of look at um tesla as a perfect example of what might be the coming recession and also lucid cars. If you think about it, you could buy, I don't know if you've done this research on your big ticket items, but a Tesla. I look at the aggregates only. I'm not, I'm not a micro guy. I like the micro because I don't know, it just puts color on it. The model, pl the plaid, you know, the really pricey version. Model S plaid last year was going for about a buck 40, 140,000. Guess how much it's going for today on the Tesla website? I wouldn't have an idea. Eighty-six thousand. I mean, that's a considerable uh, decline. Lucy Here, here's a statistic that I can give you that will help, I think, to understand this. If you want to buy a new a car, and you're a prime borrower, and you want to borrow that for four years. You have to pay 8%. If you want to borrow for, for six years and you're a prime borrower, you have to pay 8%. But in the last 12 months, average hourly earnings have only risen at a 4% annual rate. And in the last three months, average hourly earnings are only up 3.5%. Hmm. There's a huge disconnect between where the cost of borrowing to buy a new car and the rate at which wages are increasing. And, and in addition to that, you have a lot of consumers because uh, basic necessity costs went up, outstripped their income. They've heavily resorted to the credit card. Well, the credit card loan rates are 22 percent. It's astronomic. If, if, if anyone does the economics of and the compound interest effects of borrowing at that sort of rate, you, you wouldn't do it unless you absolutely had to have the funds. And, and the fact that the credit card use has been so high is an indication of how strapped the consumers are. It's going to take a long time to work this, this imbalance out, Josh. Long time. So so what's going to happen? I, I mean, are, are, is it going to be like 08 where people were given cars away for half price because there's just going to be such a glut of inventory and people can't afford it? Well, they first of all, the, 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 the companies that enjoyed the pricing power during the inflationary surge, which was brought on by the uh, excesses in monetary and fiscal policy, um, are not going to want to give the pricing power up, but they're losing it. So, I mean, we're seeing a steady drumbeat of, of information from, from uh, chief executives in a, in a lot of different fields where the pricing power is going away. Um, the, the difficulty for the firms is that their cost structures have gone up. And so as the demand falls away, they're cutting prices, but it, it's going to cut into their margins. And so they're going to be reluctant to reduce the prices, but ultimately they're going to have to. And as that, that process works out in this environment in which the money supply is contracting very sharply, 
we're going to we're going to see lower inflation. Uh, you know, inflation. The best definition of inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. What we have today is we have too many goods and too little money, and so that will bring the inflation rate down, but it will also uh, create a downturn in a lot of important components of the economy at the same time. So, so sort of your disinflationary theory is coming true before our eyes. So it took a couple of years because of COVID kind of dislodging things, but it, it does seem, and, I, and I'm using that Tesla anecdote because you got to think with Elon and all of their data that they're seeing what you're seeing. They have millions of cars that they know where you go. They know what you buy. They know what you like. It's kind of scary. And the fact for them to drop cars so significantly in price before the Fords, the GMs, you know, uh, the Ford F-150, I believe is the best-selling truck. They're, they're, they're cheaper than they used to be. But I looked at a, a data from uh, will car prices drop in 2024? And according to Kelly Blue Book, car prices are down only 3.5% since their peak. In December 2022. Now, they, they, they're coming down, but it's very gradual because, and, and that goes back to the point that I was just making. You see, their cost structure is up. And in the case of the automobile companies, remember, they agreed to um, about an 8% annualized increase in wages after a brief strike that will mm. occur over the next four years. And, and so uh, the demand is falling away from them, but their costs are there. And so they're 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 cutting them, but they're cutting them very reluctantly. But but um, I just from uh, following the, the standardized financial media, uh, we've seen that uh, makers of cereal and tennis shoes, and, uh, the retailers, uh, the retailers. There were reports during the hectic days leading up to Christmas. That, that there was substantial price cutting on important items of a third to a half. And um, uh, we're going to see more and more of that as we go forward. I want to make one important point that I, that I have not made, is that if you, if you look at the uh, 12-month inflation rate uh, in terms of the headline CPI, uh, it's come down 600 basis points. Um, that's the largest decline that the U.S. economy has ever witnessed without having a recession. Um, it's very dramatic, and your example fits right in there. Uh, and if you if you look at the headline CPI, excluding the shelter component, which is very problematic, uh, the whole structure there is, is is it comes in with a considerable lag. The inflation rate has come down more than 900 basis points. And if you look at the decline in the inflation rate that we experienced while GDP was still rising, employment was still going up, the drop that we have seen from the peak in 2022 to, to where we are now is larger than the vast majority of recessions since the 1950s. In other words, we've had a price decline that is unprecedented for an economic expansion and is and is even greater than your typical peak to trough decline that occurs in a recession. The, the inflation numbers themselves are more of a recessionary indicator than an, an, than an indication that the economy is continuing to grow. When do you think people wake up, and I still want you to tour the various sectors of the economy? Um, but I want to ask you, when do you think uh, people wake up and realize we're in a recession? Because when I'm hearing all of these things, it sounds like we're already here or a few months well, away. There, 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 are, there are a lot of indicators that indicate the economy is behaving like a recession. Uh, the inflation rate is one of them. Um, another major dichotomy uh, involves what's known as the circular flow. It's one of the universal truths in economics. And the circular flow says that what we spend must equal what we earn. In other words, that 
gross domestic product, GDP, equals gross domestic income, GDI. And um, over the latest four quarters, uh, the GDP in real dollars is up 3%, but gross domestic income is down 0.1%. That's a huge, huge discrepancy. Uh, another uh, important discrepancy is the hours worked of all non-agricultural employees. Um, uh, this takes into account the number of people that are working and the number of hours that they're working each week. And um, over the last six months, the, this index has dropped um, slightly, uh, which is, is a, it doesn't happen uh, unless you're in a recession. So uh, just to give you an idea, we were working 223 billion hours um, back at the beginning of the year, and now we're working only 222 billion. Not a huge decline, but so, so firms last year were adding employees at a slower and slower rate, but the work week was coming down. And when you net the two, your aggregate hours worked of all non-agricultural employees actually dropped. Another, another recessionary uh, indicator is uh, net national saving. Uh, last year, a very, very rare thing happened. Um, the federal budget deficit exceeded private saving and net foreign saving. This was only the eighth time that it happened. Wow. And all, all of the prior seven cases occurred during serious recessions. Uh, four of them occurred during the Great Recession, the Great Depression uh, from 1930 through 1933. And then we had uh, another three years uh, in the Great Financial Crisis Recession and its immediate aftermath. Very, very unique situation. Um, so there are important indicators that indicate the economy is, is behaving like we're in a recession. The GDP and employment is still rising, but, it, but, um, but I think that we have to keep in mind that the leading indicators of the economy, uh, money supply growth, bank credit, money supply is contracting very sharply um, in, in the last in the last one year, 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, we have declines in, in the way I like to measure money uh, in real terms. Uh, the one and two year record rates of decline over the last three years. Uh, we've had a decline of 4% per annum. Historically, money is growing at 3% per annum. Last three years, we're contracting at 4% per annum. Bank credit's a lagging indicator. Uh, it normally doesn't go negative until you're already in a recession. Um, but, but, but bank credit has contracted for the last 12, 24, and, and, and 36 months. Another, another indication of, uh, of credit stringency is the yield curve. We have an inverted yield curve. It's very inverted. And, and as a matter of fact, the yield curve has become more inverted in the last month. Uh, because the Fed kept the short rates uh, high, and but the long rates came off. Well, when you have an inverted yield curve, it's very difficult for the financial intermediaries to make a profit because what they do is they borrow short and invest long. So when the yield curve is inverted, you're upside down. Um, uh, another another indication that uh, the the economy's process of of moving downward is not complete, uh, is that the, the leading indicator index uh, continues to decline, has been declining now for more than, than 20 months. Uh, so uh, uh, this, this process and, and when we hit bottom is not in sight, in my view, not at all. Uh, do you give credence to the whole yield curve inversion leads to a recession? Have you ever found that indicator to not work? No, it's always worked. Always worked. It always has. The timing is different. The leads and the lags are different. Yeah. But but the thing about it is, I don't rely on that solely. What 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 I like to do is I like to look at 
what's happening to money supply, to bank credit, um, the yield curve. And I also like to pay very close attention to the to the overnight cost of money in real terms. And, and here's an interesting point. The last increase uh, in the federal funds rate was August. But during this time period, inflationary expectations have come down slightly. Uh, I, I use the numbers from the prestigious University of Michigan. And so in December, even though the nominal rates were unchanged, the real federal funds rate reached a new peak in December. And and uh, so the real federal funds rate, what's happening to bank credit, money supply, the yield curve, um, are very critical determinants of what happens to the new car loan rate, the credit card rates. Uh, and, and keep in mind that um, uh, one of the generalized aspects of, of this whole process, one of the reasons that monetary policy lags, uh, is that when the rates were down, people locked in their financing for a couple of years, three years. Um, but those loans are now maturing. And so the short rates are, you know, 500 plus basis points higher. And that's that's if you're a prime borrower. The, the credit standards have deteriorated. Um, the, the foreclosure numbers are always worth looking at. You ask me what's a credible source of an indication of problem is the foreclosure numbers. And um, in, the, in the third quarter, which is the latest numbers that we have, they're up 30% from a year ago. The bankruptcies are up in the high 30% range in the last year. Another another good source is um, the New York Fed's um, the delinquency rates. Virtually every single type of consumer credit item, the delinquency rates have risen. And on the automobile loans and the credit cards, the delinquency rates have, have doubled uh, in the latest quarter versus four quarters ago. Uh, these, are, these are all signs of of monetary stringency and of the effects of the monetary stringency on the financial well-being of the American household. And, and the process is indicate indication that this restraint is intensifying even into the month of, of, of December. For those of you just joining us, I'm Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback. We're live on Twitter Spaces, have about 62 people joined us, Lacey Hunt. So, uh, you're, you know, I'm not even really that, uh, big on Twitter space or on Twitter. So folks, I'm kind of new to Twitter spaces. So follow me if you want, uh, more guests of Lacey's caliber, we'll get them on Twitter spaces. So make sure you follow me for rooms that I try to do. And, you know, also if you have a question, uh, submit it to Joe and Joe, uh, will bring you up, uh, because I trust Joe to be a good moderator. So if you have a good question for Dr. Lacey Hunt, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, Dr. Hunt is taking us on a tour of his 2024 outlook. We talked about multifamily. We talked about commercial. Uh, anything you'd like to add on residential housing? Well, I think residential housing will recover. Uh, it will be a slow process. But I, I think as we go through the year, the long treasury rates will work their way lower. They've already come down, and it's it's bringing the uh, the mortgage rates down with it. Um, but but it won't be a clear shot because at the same time, I think uh, households are going to find a less attractive labor market, which will weigh against the recovery. But I think that the the single family uh, housing market has the best chance of of uh, putting at a bottom and having some recovery. Having said that, I want to make it clear that I think the weakness in the multifamily sector will more than offset whatever the gains are in the single family market. Yeah, I definitely see that. What about uh, hard landing versus soft landing? We know you've been on Bloomberg saying we're heading for a hard landing for for the better part of a year. Uh, do you see any? I don't, I don't think it's the hard landing term until November, but. Uh, okay. Any, say recession. No. 
hard, to me, a hard landing session. Well, maybe Basically. I was reading in, but um, do you think uh, there's any chance of a soft landing or no? I don't. I think that the. I I, I don't know instances where you can have uh, such a. Uh, uh, well, let me just let me let me rephrase that. I think that there are several important lessons <laughs> that I've learned from the business side, <clears throat> and one is uh, is that. Inflations lead recessions. Now, recess, inflations don't just happen. They, they happen because there is uh, excess monetary policy or some sort of combination of excess monetary and fiscal policy. And we, we had both of them in 2020 and 2021, which produced the high inflation. And so whenever you, you get these inflationary episodes, the, the Fed has to uh, relieve the suffering that's occurring for the broad, uh, modest, and moderate income households, and and so um, they they then have to decelerate money and credit growth. Uh, they have to go through a lengthy process, version of the yield curve. Um, these these sorts of things take time, and the lags are always a lot variable. Uh, they're never the same from one cycle to the next. I've calculated that from the peak of the financial cycle to the start of the recession, uh, the the average uh, lag is about five to eight quarters. Well, the loosest con- monetary conditions were uh, in the fourth quarter of 2022. So um, uh, uh, right now, uh, I mean, the fourth quarter of 2021, so right now we're eight quarters after after the loosest monetary conditions, and so the, that monetary restraint is working its way through the system. But the Federal Reserve is still tightening. Um, I think when when the final numbers come in for the month of December, we'll see that the Fed did another ninety billion dollars of quantitative tightening. When they do that, um, for every dollar of quantitative tightening, I calculate that they're going. Uh, to reduce uh, other deposit liabilities, which I consider to be the best best measure of money, uh, by another dollar and a half. And so uh, the Fed uh, has done quantitative tightening of slightly more than a trillion dollars, approaching $1.1 trillion. And other deposit liabilities of the banks uh, have fallen, you know, $1.6 trillion. That's what's brought the money supply growth down. Uh, Bank liabilities or money leads bank credit. So the positive side is shrinking. It's forcing the banks uh, to shrink bank credit. Um, the banks have done a fairly good job so far of, of holding their loans, but just barely, but they've been heavy sellers of treasury securities. But, but if you look at total bank loans um, uh, in the last 12 months ending November, they're unchanged, adjusted for inflation. I think when we get the December number, we will see that there's an actual decline in bank loans adjusted for inflation. If you look at the critical commercial and industrial loans, so-called business loan category, um, that, that's registered a decline for 2022, even even notwithstanding we don't know the final numbers for, for December. So uh, Fed policy is is restrictive, very restrictive in many ways, unprecedentedly so. Um, and if it doesn't matter which of the monetary variables you look at. They all tell you the same story. And uh, given the fact that we have this five to nine quarter range between the peak and financial conditions and the start of the recession, um, it, 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 it's a process that works out. But what we do know, but also from the business cycle, is that once the recessionary forces congeal, which I believe they will, that monetary policy will not be nearly as effective as it was in combating inflation. I think it, I think people are going to find out that for the Fed to make a reversal and have a quick effect, that's not going to work. There, there's a lot written in the literature about what's called pushing on a string. You can't really push on a string. And um, I think that the, the, when the Fed reverses itself and starts cutting the federal funds, which I believe they will, uh, it will not work miracles. It no. will not restore the economy to where it was. It will take time. 
And this process is going to work out not just in 2024, but in 2025 and 2026. No, fascinating. Okay, we're going to go to some listener questions, uh, Joe and then Tina. Joe, go ahead with your question for Dr. Hunt. Hi. Yes, thank you. Thank you for uh, having me up, and Dr. Hunt, big fan of your work. I guess the question I want to ask most succinctly is, I want to hear your response as comprehensive as possible to the market commentators who say that the increased fiscal dominance, the, the structural deficits that we're running, have muted the monetary effects, particularly, I mean, I've heard you uh, in the past you know, describe how the money multiplier is negative, um, but you know, with the, the deficits that are currently being accrued, is it really sort of a... Uh, a mistake to focus on the credit cycle, to focus on the monetary tightening when fiscal has become so dominant? Oh, great question. Uh, my position on this is very strong. I mentioned just a few minutes ago that in, in 2023, we had the economy experienced what's called a negative net national saving. Uh, the federal budget deficit exceeded the uh, total private and, and foreign saving. Um, that's a very, very serious problem because uh and if you look at the if you look at the circular flow we know that physical investment must equal saving net saving of our three sectors private and the government and the farm and we had a negative so when you have negative saving you're not in a position to get physical investment which means you cannot in get an increase in the capital stock Without an increase in the capital stock, you're not going to be able to raise your standard of living over time. Another way of looking at it, you can look at it, the financial flows. Uh, last year, um, if you sort of back out the, the various transactions related to uh, forgiving the student loans and then reinstating them, the, the budget deficit in 2022 was, was $2 trillion. It was $2 trillion again. Uh, I'm sorry, it was $1 trillion in 2021, um, 2022, and then it was $2 trillion in 2023. Um, so the, the private, domestic, non-bank sector funded all of that. But in addition, the private, domestic, non-bank sector had to fund $1.1 trillion of the Fed's selling of Treasury securities and the commercial bank selling of another $600 billion worth of Treasuries. So the domestic, private, non-bank sector funded $3.7 trillion of Treasury securities. And so those funds were transferred from the private sector where we have a high multiplier into the government sector where we have a negative multiplier. There's extensive academic research that shows that when you engage in um, uh, deficit uh, activities that you you do benefit the economy transitorily for about four to six quarters, but by the by the end of three years the multiplier is negative. But we had a massive conversion or shift from from private sector resources into the government sector, and that's going to continue uh, in twenty twenty four and probably a long time into the future. Uh, I, I I cannot emphasize the importance of the fact. The net national saving is now negative. This is, it only happened seven times before uh, the Great Depression and then in the Great Financial Crisis recession. That puts the economy in a very vulnerable situation. It basically means uh, Keynes had a statement. He said that he, he referred to the paradox of, um, of saving. And he meant this as to, to denigrate the idea that um, what you're taught to do as an individual doesn't work for the global economy. But the paradox of saving doesn't exist when you have negative net national saving because you're not going to be in a position to fund capital investment, which is the key to a rising standard of living. The, the, the federal budget situation is, is not just a restraining factor for 2023, but it will be a restraining factor for a long time. And there's a new innovation that's, that's sort of now causing consumers to even want to save less. And that's called the buy now, pay later. Well, that's a, 
when when you when you borrow to spend, that's the same thing as this saving. And so the proliferation of the of the buy now pay later programs will actually exacerbate uh, the negative net national saving that we're confronted with, and for which the root basic cause is the federal budget. Does. Great question. I'm glad to have an opportunity to explain it. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Next up, Tina had a question for Dr. Lacey Hunt. Go ahead, Tina. Hello, Dr. Hunt. I, I actually, I've learned a lot from you, and I really appreciate you doing these spaces. You impart a lot of wisdom to people from your years of experience. I have a question regarding sessions, but how is net national savings calculated? I might have known this at one time when I took economics, but I took economics both like 40 and 30 some odd years ago. And I I don't recall okay. how net national okay. savings. Well, it's, first of all, it's in the National Income and Product Account, so you can get it um, from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. So the number, that I, but hey, well, I'm going to tell you how to count it. Okay. So if you start, because it's a great question, and it tells me that you're sincerely interested in the process. And so we know that GDI equals GDP, right? That's the circular flow. That has to be. But by algebraic substitution, we know that physical investment I must equal saving net investment. net, And in the, in the parlance of a national accounting excludes depreciation. So net investment excludes depreciation, net saving excludes depreciation. Um, so um, also by algebraic uh, substitution, uh, the foreign saving, the current account deficit is the inverse of foreign saving. In other words, if you run a current account deficit, uh, the rest of the world the rest of the world has to take your IOUs. So the current account deficit is the inverse of, of the, our national uh, f- foreign saving is the inverse of the current account. Um, now, the private saving uh, is the household saving plus the government. So when you, when you have negative net national saving, what that means is that the household saving plus the government saving, which we define as private, plus the foreign saving, which is the inverse of the current account, exceeds the federal budget deficit. That's the definition. I'm glad you asked it. It's an indication you're really trying to understand the concepts. My hat's off to you. Okay. They're, uh, they're with me. I think we have, we had over 150 people in. Well, I can't explain that. <laughs> and then um, um, we're going to go to Deer Point Macro next. And then, Joe, um, Joe, you can invite a co host anybody you want. Uh, this will also be edited and up as a YouTube. So make sure you follow my YouTube. We will get it up. Um, I'll add you back as a co host, Tina. Um, oh. Well, I just a speaker then. I don't know. You only allowed two co-hosts. I'll make you a speaker, Tina. I'm sorry. Um, I, I'm not as conversant. I'm I miss the old clubhouse days, but uh, I, I guess I gotta you know get back with the times. So, okay, everybody can hear me. I'm sorry. I think I gotta update the app, but I, I always find Twitter Spaces glitchy. But maybe it's just me because I'm not conversing in it so okay who do we got next uh dear point macro is a question go ahead dear point for dr lacy on yeah thank you so much josh uh so dr lacy um just a, a a question here um and it's kind of in regards to some work that i've been doing on the back of, of robert solo's um you know growth model and unfortunately we had his passing um which is you know kind of a big blow to to economics and the profession in and of itself but um well, he, he, a lot solo was a great thinker he worked in the confines of the production function the production function exactly and so you know i i've been kind of looking at 
um, two derivatives. First, kind of measuring the height of a Z vertical, which I, I don't want to bore people with technicalities, but the, the first derivative of that is going to be capital. And what I've kind of found is, you know, capital utilization is always brought to an optimum um, during a business cycle in, in developed countries like the United States. Um, and, you know, the priority of capital income is kind of the center of the circular model. Um, and capital obviously has the advantage over labor and kind of getting to the, the question here. That's a, that's a critical point. It's a critical point in the circular flow. No question about it. In the circular flow. But unlike capital, labor never seems to reach um, its optimum utilization. Um, and so, you know, obviously capital comes first in kind of the idea of capitalism. And since, you know, the 1990s, the utilization of labor has been getting worse um, and trending, you know, upward. Um, and so we're seeing an increasingly unmet potential of labor utilization. So do you see any kind of problems with this going forward? Or do you just think that this is where we're going to see kind of what Robert Solo started to point out with the, you know, the, the solo residual where we see more of a shift to, you know, things like total factor productivity and increasing output instead of utilization of, of labor, especially in developed markets? Thank you. I, I don't see it changing. And this is my own personal view here, but can you um, rephrase this question for people who speak plain English first? Okay, what what he's asking of, of, no of whether dear, but just for of whether we can listeners. get a more productive uh, effect of of our labor pool uh, than what we have historically done. That's the way I interpret his question, and I, I'm. I'm not an, a labor expert, but I'm going to give this a shot because it's such a good question and an insightful question. Uh, but um, I, I am afraid uh, that our educational system is failing us very significantly. Uh, we've greatly increased our expenditures for education, uh, but the results are getting worse in terms of, of the real serious measures of educational achievement. And um, as a consequence, I, I don't expect it to change. But let, let me address another aspect of, of the aggregate production function, and which, of course, Solo did so much for us to work with. Um, I believe that the condition of negative nat national saving means that we've placed a con constraint on capital. But you're, you're not going to be able to increase capital unless you have positive net national saving. And so if, if, you, if you're in a situation of negative net national savings, such as we are now, it means that you do not have the resources to fund new projects, as meritorious as they may be. You, you do not have resources to fund a, a larger federal budget deficit. The resources have to be clawed out of the existing capital stock. And that, that's an entirely different situation than has been the normal case. So I, I view the negative net national saving as a, as a constraint on the operation of the pro aggregate production function as long as this condition exists. And I, I don't see any way around it currently. And uh, now you may say, well, what evidence do we have that this is happening? Um, take a look. Um, at what's been happening to our real per capita growth rate since the 1970s. And by the way, I, I use, uh, for real per capita growth, I use the average of GDI and GDP. I think we have to, because right now we have a record gap in the last four quarters between the growth rate in gross domestic income and gross domestic product. 
And both of those are equal concepts. And so in this environment, you have to take the average. So in 1970, the 20 years leading, ending in 1970, we were growing at 2.2% per annum. In the 20 years ending 2023, knowing that we don't have the fourth quarter number, just an estimate, we're at 1.3. We, we have lost, uh, you know, a half of our real per capita growth rate, which is the key to the standard of living. And um, if we remain in this negative net national savings situation, uh, the problem is going to get worse not better, which means that the standard of living will go to even a slower crawl, and history has shown, at least to my satisfaction, that as the rate of growth in the standard of living comes down, you get an exacerbation of the income and wealth divides. Now, in this environment, there will be calls for greater uh, government spending. But you already have negative net national saving, which means then the government spending programs by themselves will be self-defeating. In other words, there's no fiscal solution in the current environment. And I'm afraid that the demographics are not going to be positive, And I don't believe the natural resource or land component will be positive either. It'll be stable, but. It's not going to be of a dynamic nature to help us. And so I'm afraid we're caught in a, in a growth quagmire. Um, the only, the only uh, somewhat pleasing aspect is that the problem are more acute in Europe, Japan, and China than they are in the United States. But there, and that's the problem too, because there's, there's really no engine of growth among the four areas of the world that account for almost 80% of global GDP. Go to another. Let's, uh, Joe had a follow-up question. Go ahead, Joe, and then we'll go back to you, dear. Sorry, sorry, it it was cutting out. I wasn't sure if Dr. Hunt was uh, finished. I just wanted to ask a quick follow-up on that. Yono, follow follow up absolutely. Let's try to answer it if I can. Thank you so much. So, so with that given a, a decline in capital stock, um, and you know, I've I've done some work on this where I I believe soon the pace of and, and maybe for people who don't know capital stock, just think of it as plants, machinery, equipment, or, or real economic assets, just to keep things simplistic for those listening. I'm glad you I'm glad you said that because we're talking about tangible assets here. Many people assume that accelerating money supply growth is an anecdote to that problem. It's not an anecdote. Not at all. Because it, it, you, you need tangible assets to be available. In other words, to fund an increase in the capital stock, someone has to push back from the dinner table. You have to have resources to be allocated to, to the capital stock. And I'm, so I'm glad that you emphasized that. Go ahead with your question. Sir. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. So kind of the, the work that I've been doing, I'm predicting probably in the next decade that the rate of capital consumption will outcre- uh, like outpace the, the rate of new investment in the capital stock, which I think is going to be a very dire or maybe for less think of capital consumption as depreciation again for those kind of in the, in the audience. And so I, I believe kind of in my view, and this is kind of where I wanted to get your opinion, is what we're going to see is a more rapid decline in the real economy and a further increase in financialization, which means, you know, more debt to generate a dollar of GDP, which, you know, I, I think as well is probably going to contract further the velocity of money, as kind of Irving Fisher himself pointed out. And, you know, as a function of that, we're going to be in this kind of perpetual debt cycle to generate growth. And again, yes, America's not as bad off as China or some other nations. But do you ever think that we're going to get to a point where something changes? Or is this just going to be the path of growth forward where now financialization has been made so much more attractive because of what the Fed did in 2008, removing the moral hazard for managers across 
you know, kind of different sectors where it's more attractive to be in financial assets than real in, than in real economic assets because one, they're more liquid than real economic assets and the rates of return have been more attractive. And so do you just think that this is going to be something that's going to be perpetual and further exacerbated where like my predictions 10 years, 15 years down the road, capital consumption will outpace investment in the capital stock and everything's just going to flow into financial assets. I, I can't, I, I have the same position that you do. And I, I look at those trends. I'm afraid that the net depreciation is going to rise. And I don't see a pathway to restoring positive net national saving. Um, in other, in, in several instances, I've referred that, I've called that the race to the bottom. And I don't like to use that kind of terminology, but we've, we've actually taken, um, monetary policy to too great of an extreme. And, uh, uh, the fact of the matter is the, the, the Fed's actions can, can, can be, used to help things at the margin, but they cannot be used uh, in, a, in a massive way such as we've, we've tried in the past. Uh, they, they work for short periods of time. And if you're a trader, uh, you may like that, but unfortunately uh, that doesn't help out the vast majority of our people. It makes them worse off. And, and so your logic um, is seems impeccable to me. I applaud you for reaching those conclusions. Okay, so uh, go ahead. Thank you, dear. Go ahead, Joe. You're on. Yeah. So, Doctor, and just as a follow up to my earlier question, I understand you, you your 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 commentary about um, you know fiscal can't get us out of this. We're we're in sort of a growth uh, a negative growth spiral, uh, but but the fiscal can certainly delay the inevitable, right? I mean, isn't that going into election years? Um, isn't that to be expected? I mean, isn't this recession something that could be put off considerably uh, for, for quarters or even years by increased fiscal spending? Uh, there is a short-term multiplier. It worked. It's, it's, the multiplier is positive very slightly for the first four to six quarters. But then it turns negative. It's negative at the end of three years. But you see, fiscal policy is also responsive to inflation. and um, if you if you look at what what some of the credible folks are saying about the budget deficit for 2024, is that we're actually going to have some modest degree of fiscal restraint. Um, uh, I, I get my budget numbers from um, Don Schneider and Andy Leperrier at Piper Sandler. They do a great job. I check them with other folks, um, and what they're saying is that federal expenditures in nominal dollars for fiscal 24, and keep in mind, we, we've already now finished three months or within a couple of days of finishing the first three months of the fiscal year, the federal fiscal expenditures will be flat in nominal dollars. The interest expense will be up 15.5%, but the non-interest expense will be down 1.5%. So now you may say, well, why? This is an election year. Don't, don't, don't we usually see uh, short-term positive fiscal policy during an election year? Well, uh, last year to raise the debt ceiling, um, there, there were constraints. They were built into the law. And uh, as a result of that, and, and, and the, there were a variety of different programs that had appropriations that were not entirely spent, but those un unexpended appropriations were reallocated to debt reduction. And so we will actually, the way it looks right now, it could change, but as of right now, three months uh, after the first three months of the fiscal year, non-defense spending will fall in nominal dollars in 2024. And um, I, I can I can tell you that uh, that the Piper Sandler forecast is also very similar to the one from Goldman Sachs. So we do not have 
the prospect of, of a fiscal stimulus for 2024. Go ahead, uh, TXMC. You're on with Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback, and Dr. Lacey Hunt. We have just about eight minutes left, uh, seven minutes left with Dr. Hunt. So if you have a question, let us know. We'll try to get you on. Go ahead, TXMC. Thanks, Josh. And uh, thank you, Dr. Hunt, for giving us time today. I'm a really, uh, big fan of your work. Um, one of the things I've been doing some research on and trying to learn about, um, pay a lot of attention to, is credit. And I think going into 2024, one of the stories that has not yet been resolved and we don't know the outcome of is the refinancing of corporate America at the new cost of money, which predominantly has not happened at the speed of this tightening cycle. Um, and we've moved so far away from where rates were when corporate America last accessed credit in mass. Uh, and the delta between that and what the market's optimistic expectation of Fed cuts for next year is leaves a pretty interesting story as to what's going to happen to a lot of businesses that need to access debt in the next 12 to 15, 18 months. And when you look at the rate of growth of bank loans, you, you, you talked about this earlier in your chat, the rate of growth of credit, of bank credit, of business loans, um, all of these things have slowed down in this Fed tightening cycle, which is you know about 20, 21 months old, have those those rates of change have halted faster than any other era going back to the to the fifties. To about you have to go back to 1953, 54, which is ironically a flu pandemic, um, to find another time when the rate of change of credit slowed down this quickly in Fed tightening. Um, and all of those year, all of those instances when it's even come close to this kind of a, of a halting of the credit edifice has led to a recession, as you well know. And so what I'm kind of wondering about heading into this next year is <clears throat> how does that story play out, the delta between what the market thinks the Fed is going to be able to cut in a cycle when we have had inflation um, and what is actually needed for corporate America's refinancing not to be punitive based on their current rate, right? Um, and how much of that financing, maybe just in the last couple of years especially, has actually been pushed out of the commercial banks and into private credit, where we're not seeing it on these business loan and, and series on the, on the Fred website, right? Like, that's a more opaque market. And I see all these stories in Bloomberg um, about how banks are offloading a lot of their risk into private credit, how more riskier businesses are accessing lending in that market, direct lending. The guy from uh, the CIO from Castle Lake just the other couple months ago, he said that he thinks that direct lending is now 50% of the leveraged loan market now, and it continues to grow. And we don't know all the risks associated over there. The risk is more concentrated than it is in like the syndicated markets where the banks used to do most of the loan origination. You know, since the since the GFC, as the regulators cracked down on that on the commercial side, that behavior didn't just stop. It just spilled out of the walls of the regulators' purview and now is with private lending, which has grown. I think now it's one and a half trillion dollars. That's that's my figure. I use that I use that one and a half trillion dollar figure. The the banks have seventeen. Yeah. My question for you, sir, I guess, is just how are you thinking about these risks, as, as particularly with private credit, and and how do you think this the story with corporate America needing to refinance at the new cost of money will play out over the next year? Well, I, I, I don't I don't see it in equilibrium uh, because the the rates are materially higher, and the the pace at which the Fed will be able to bring the federal funds rate down will be more measured. Uh, because the inflation rate lagging indicator will still be uh, above above the Fed's target until we get into the you know probably mid year. Maybe it'll be a little sooner, but it might be a little later. Uh, so the Fed's response will have to be measured. But the corporate your point is very well taken. I, I see the I see the situation in the same terms you see it. Uh, and and keep in mind that uh, the, the number that I'm using is that there's about $1.2 trillion of debt that has to be refinanced. Um, and now uh, uh, some of that's held by the banks, some of it's held by the non-bank sector, but the, the non-bank sector needs funding from the banks too. Um, 
and and it's not just the fact that the loans are maturing um, and and the the prime rates of borrowing are higher is that a lot of the folks that that, that took these uh, greatest risks have their credit quality has deteriorated and so they're going to have to pay a, they're not going to borrow at the same a credit worthy rate uh, in 2024 that they borrowed at in 2020 and 2021, early 2022. And, and so um, the rate will be higher, but there, there, I, I believe, and I, I assume from what you're thinking as well, is that there are a lot of folks that are not, not going to be able to obtain refinancing for a variety of different reasons. In other words, the, the process of, of the Fed reversal is is not going to come in time uh, to to avoid uh, the potentiality of this adjustment process uh, being strung out and carried over uh, beyond 2024, perhaps well beyond 2024. But but I see the analysis the same way you did. You, in fact, I think you expressed it better than I did. Congratulations to you. Sir. So how would you, what, anything you wanted to share, Dr. Hunt, that you didn't get to share with our audience? Yes, I want to say this, that this discussion is purely for educational purposes only, that I'm not uh, uh, marketing on behalf of my company, and I'm not uh, offering investment advice to anyone. <laughs> this, is, this is just a purely academic, uh, intellectual discussion. And and um, we will try to keep you on until we get our next guest. Our next guest is uh, Matt Schultz from Lending Tree. He'll be on next if you want to hold on. But uh, he's not coming in yet, so we can keep talking to Dr. Hunt. Dr. Hunt, I want to ask you this question. 07 to 09 parallels. How does this recession yet to be compare with 07 and 09? I know you study a lot of historical parallels. Well, uh, one of the important parallels is that is that we we experienced a significant monetary contraction, but there is also a, a big difference. Um, the behavior of bank credit has been of what I would call a contracyclical normal pattern. The, the bank credit, in real terms, and we have to we have to deflate because the the purchasing power of of a loan goes down if the inflation rate goes up. So you've got to put it in real terms. And once you do that with bank credit, what you will see is that on a one-year, two-year, three-year basis, real bank credit does not go negative until you're already in a recession. This time, for example, in the 08, 09 period, real bank credit did not go negative for either a one, two, or three-year period until the recession was always already over. This time, We've actually had a contraction in real bank credit, and the economy was still expanding as a, as a com- major dichotomy. And it indicates to me that monetary policy is more restrictive than is generally understood. And then, Joe, uh, last question until we get our next guest on. Go ahead. Steve, Pat. I'm curious as to what your response is to some of the more structural bond market bears out there who claim that even if you get a recession, we won't get yields down to a new low. Will uh, technically, you know, be in a higher trend from here uh, structurally for the remainder of the decade into the next with higher yields. What is your response to that? Okay, um, you know, I I was for most of my career I was a, a great advocate of, of Milton Friedman's uh, interest rate theory, and Friedman said that monetary accelerations lead to higher interest rates. Monetary decelerations lead to lower interest rates. I, I corrected Friedman's famous paper written in 1969, and I said monetary accelerations lead to higher interest rates and less offset by a countervailing move in velocity, and that monetary decelerations and less countervailed by velocity lead to lower rates. The monetary deceleration was so substantial, and I believe that it means that we're going to see a, a significant decline spread out over several years. And I think one of the elements that's going to enter the picture, which is contrary to what has happened in the last couple of years, velocity is going to turn down, has risen over the last couple of years. uh, And that's actually thwarted uh, the Fed's ability 
to uh, to uh, achieve the, uh, the, the the inflation rate target. They've, they've achieved a massive movement in the direction of their target, but they have not they have not returned it to the target. But I think velocity is going to reverse, and the two reasons that I believe that is because velocity, the main determinants, are the ma- marginal revenue product of debt and the loan to deposit ratio at the banks. The marginal revenue product of debt is going to move lower. And for uh, one of the main reasons is well, we've already discussed it. We haven't tied it to velocity. But um, as this interest expense goes up because of the refinancing, and as some participants in the economy are denied the rollover of their existing loan, the marginal revenue product will go down. When you, when you have to take an income stream and allocate more of that stream to interest expense, that's a net, a net weight loss. Increase in debt is an increase in current spending in exchange for a decline in future spending. But if you exacerbate the interest payments relative to your initial borrowing, that will mean that the effect is even greater to the downside. Uh, the other element, uh, and once the downturn takes place, we will see a significant weakness in the bank loans. And, and the banks will try to protect their earnings, and they will offset that by buying government securities. So when the banks begin funding more government and less private sector, that will shift their funding from the uh, high multiplier private sector to the negative multiplier government sector. And so the, the element that, that may not be taken properly into consideration is this upturn in velocity that we've witnessed the last couple of years, in my view, will reverse. And it's going to make the, the normal condition of uh, pushing on a string seem like child's play. Great Fantastic. Question. I want to thank you so much for joining us uh, on Twitter Spaces, folks. Follow me for more insightful economic commentary. We have guests like Dr. Hunt on all the time. Thank you, Dr. Hunt. You're a fan favorite. And always a pleasure talking uh, out economic outlook with you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for giving me a chance to interface with your clients. Thank you so much. And folks, uh, next we have Matt Schultz. So uh, we'll break it for a couple minutes. Uh, you guys can keep the room going. And then uh, we'll be back with Matt Schultz. Thank you so much, Dr. Hunt. Always a pleasure.